Oh, hello, Dennis. You've got zombie takeout all over your vest. You really ought to look after your appearance, you know. Very bad for business. Hello and welcome to episode 431 of Zombie, Zombie Takeout, the B-Movie and Cult Movie Podcast. I'm John. And hello, I'm Scotto. And yes, we're at the time of year where senioritis is going to begin kicking in. Two episodes yeah. left. Mine is... thought occurred to me, mm-hmm. why are we doing three episodes between Thanksgiving and Christmas? Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. insane. Well, yeah, I think we only had one last year. But yeah. mine is so bad that, okay, so last Saturday I photoshopped the thumbnails and did my research and notes for this week a couple of days earlier than usual. Yeah. Sunday night I photoshopped the album art and did my research and notes for next week. All of my pre-production is done for the year, barring listener submitted or an interesting wow. news story. If I were capable of the temporal fuckery required to edit, upload, and schedule four episodes that we hadn't recorded yet, I would have absolutely done it. I mean, it, I think we just felt bad about the whole beginning of the year and not doing anything for the first like two yeah, and a half yeah. months that we felt obligated to come back and finish strong here. I think it's just kind of normal. It, it's normal. Last year was a little off because you had a lot going on. Sure. Um, so, you know, that's why we only did like the one after Thanksgiving. Um, real quick, also, by the way, little Mia Culpa. So, it turns out that Cheerleader Ninjas is the one that we should have reviewed last week. (laughs) Um, That's the one I saw listed on Netflix years ago and that I intended to put on the list. But my dyslexia got in the way. I flipped the title and there just so happened to be a movie called Ninja Cheerleaders. Um, From what I was reading, uh, Ninja Cheerleaders is apparently a sequel. Um, But I saw the trailer for Cheerleader Ninjas, the, the first one. It's much better, much more up our alley. We'll have to get to Wait, it next year. That was supposed to have been a sequel to the other one. I mean, not, not like a remake. Yeah, yeah, maybe it was a remake. I don't know, but it. We'll we'll have to get to Cheerleader Ninjas next year. Yeah. Um, one quick anecdote, also before we get to the news. So, and this is maybe a very, 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 very slight spoiler for season three of Star Trek Discovery. If you're super obsessively picky about that sort of thing. Um. <laughs> So at the end of last season, they jump to they jump nearly a thousand years into the future to the thirty second century. Right. Spoiler: They make it. Of, of course. <laughs> they actually arrive in the thirty second century. I mean, there's a season, so we assume <laughs> they made it. Yeah. So they, they, it just didn't fail. They didn't stay in the twenty second. Um, and and this is the the other spoiler. Um, and it's not a plot thing, uh, but a piece of technology that's very common in that time period in the Star Trek universe is programmable matter. Uh, basically okay. nanites that can form into whatever you want. Sure. Every time it's mentioned or I see it on the show, I immediately think of Neil Breen in the trailer from uh, Twisted Pair, programmable matter. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very commonplace on the show this season, so he's practically ruined the season for me. I mean, what was the other thing? Programmable virtual reality. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like, that's, um... that's the thing, because it popped into my head. I knew that was Neil Breen's voice, but I could not remember where it was coming from. I'm like, that has to be Twisted Pair. Over the weekend, <laughs> I watched the trailer, and yeah, it was Twisted Pair. And then I'm like, I was I couldn't remember what you know what I thought of the movie. I mean, I could check the rating easily enough, but I went and listened to the episode. I remember not liking that movie, certain things about that movie. I was surprised they gave it a five. Um, oh, because, I mean, it's hilarious. Because it's brain. We, I gave it a five because of brain, yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> programmable virtual reality, of course, is like, yeah. how else would you have virtual reality? Yeah. You think the, the programming fairy came in and <laughs> <laughs> you have this software now? Yeah. Incidentally, programmable matter is something that DARPA is working on. They're of way course. far off from every from having it, but they are working on it. And now on to the obvious news story. Warner Brothers will release its films on HBO Max and in theaters simultaneously. The decision may change movie going forever. 
This is from time.com. Two news stories this week on Eat One on Each show, much bigger sources than usual. Um, Warner Brothers announced that it plans to release all 17 of its films planned for 2021 on HBO Max and in theaters simultaneously, including would-be blockbusters like Matrix 4, In the Heights, and The Suicide Squad. Warner Brothers had previously said it would uh, release this year's Wonder Woman 1984, arguably their most anticipated movie of 2020, simultaneously on streaming and theaters in, on December 25th. The Warner Brothers, the Warner Media, ha- has said the simultaneous release experiment, a response to the COVID-19 pandemic, will last one year. Cinephile, cinephiles worry that if audiences get used to expen- ex- to seeing expensive top-tier movies at home. They may give up on the cinematic experience entirely. Major theater chain AMC is aggressively pushing back against Warner Brothers' plan. I mean, people are already accustomed to seeing major movies at home already, you know? It's only been since the pandemic that they've been widely... that that brand new movies are coming home. uh, home. Uh, I think Netflix and Hulu have put together... I mean... uh, as much as I wasn't a fan of The Irishman, it was still, you know, a Martin Scorsese movie. Oh, yes. There are some great originals on, on the streaming services, absolutely. Um, and Netflix Netflix is the new HBO in that sense. You know. And, I mean, the, the Coen brothers, I'm trying to think of, you know, Buster Scruggs. Mm-hmm. You know, the fact that they, they went to Netflix first, you know, rather than releasing it mm-hmm. in the theater. Yeah. You know, people are getting, we're already starting to get into that habit. But this is kind of eating the theater's lunch, which is something we've kind of seen coming for years. Yeah. And years. We've debated this before because we're kind of on opposite sides. I... Well, once you started getting large screen televisions, mm-hmm. you know, there was only so much the theaters could, could withhold. But yeah. I think I think they'll, they'll, they'll find their own niche, well, you know? I'm, I haven't seen a movie in a theater since Cloverfield. So... I, I'm very happy to stay home and watch new movies. There are only a couple that I'm at all interested in, the Dune remake and right. Matrix and Matrix 4 because David Mitchell, my favorite author, co-wrote the script. But I'm planning to watch all of them just to support the experiment. <laughs> They're only going to be on HBO for a month, by the way. Mm. Um, but I, I, in my opinion, fuck theaters. I don't care. <laughs> Well, I think I think they'll find their niche. Mm-hmm. I think, uh, especially when this is all done, yeah. the people are going to be just dying to. Well, not dying. I guess should not use. You know, <laughs> yeah, that's not a good way to put it. <laughs> well, you know what? Everybody's been doing that. People have been like, these businesses are dying, and it's like you you keep using that word. I do not think you <laughs> understand what it means. Uh-huh. We've had an ongoing <laughs> but, debate about a certain genre of music that you keep using that word about. <laughs> but. Uh, you know, people are going to really want to do something social, you know? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And I think, and I've said this, even back in the day when we owned one in the late 90s, mm-hmm. just, like, do a TV viewing yeah. in the theater, well, you know? That's the thing. The average 10-plex down the corner isn't going to isn't gonna be around much longer. And it know? shouldn't. Those were ridiculous. Yeah. Um, you're, I agree. As soon when the pandemic is over, they're gonna see a boom. They're gonna get a big push for a brief time. Yes. But, Honestly, a couple of the greatest experiences I've ever had in a theater outside of our own, of course, because mm-hmm. we did so much crazy shit in our own theater. <laughs> um, I saw, I saw the season premiere, the first two episodes of a season of Doctor Who. Oh wow! It was uh, with Matt Smith. Mm-hmm. It was like the first Doctor Who I'd seen in a while because they were on BBC America or something. Right. They weren't being shown on PBS anymore. And just to have like all the Whovians nice. in under a roof mm-hmm. and just going nuts. It was the one where um the astronaut Okay. Nice. It was that season, you know? So just see like the Apollo landing and the silence mm-hmm. and all that on on the big screen and everything yeah. with all the Whovians together. It, it was fucking crazy. It was like, I cannot wait to see the rest of the season. I wasn't but, a big fan of Smith as, as the doctor, but that was a damn good season. That was the first time I'd seen him actually. Mm-hmm. Like, like they were only showing tenant reruns on PBS at okay. the time. And it was like a special thing to have BBC America to see the mm-hmm. latest. 
And I think the other one was seeing the Deep Space Nine documentary and have oh, like wow. all the Trek heads nice, nice. there, just like. <laughs> But, you know, after this boom that the theaters will probably see after the pandemic, the only way that any of them are going to stay alive long term is to go niche. You know, yes, things exactly. like the, the Alamo Draft House, where you can get like a good meal and drink and booze and see a movie. And they Honestly, have, you know, not theme a nights. fan of eating a meal during the movie. It's but, just it's you know, just too much. But But things like that, things that give you an experience that you can't get at home watching it, you know. Uh, you know, on your own stuff. Um, so I'm saying a more socially oriented experience where yeah, yeah. it's just like a TV show, right. a couple hours worth once a week, all the fans get together and, and watch a season of something, you know? And, and I think that's really another thing that they could play into is, is the more, there's the social angle. You're not going to get that at home because you just can't cram that many exactly. people. <laughs> yeah. More themed events, more event stuff. Just one I mean, more. But oh, our yeah. bread and butter when we owned the theater was the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Yeah, yeah. like without that, we would our doors would have been closed uh-huh. well before they actually were closed. And I still wish it was playing anywhere near here. I'd still be going. My God, where that's you don't even think of that since Tom's River, you know, lost that theater and there was one lost that it, one. It played for a little bit in Tom's River. I missed it entirely, unfortunately, but yeah, that was only for a couple of years. Not even Red Bank. Well, that's a little far from me. Oh but. man. I don't even think it is playing there. Honestly, the theater we owned was about five minutes down the road from where I lived at the time. So <laughs> it was very convenient. <laughs> yeah. One more quick thing uh, before we get to this week's movie. Um, I found out while watching this week's movie that all of the pre-Daniel Craig Bond movies are free on YouTube. Like, legally free bar YouTube movies. So, if you're into the Bond thing, have that. Now, finally, on to this week's movie, which is from 1977, Jabberwocky. This is our David Prowse tribute. And, of course, on to the impromptu plot summary, sponsored by Punchlines. When writing jokes, you might want to include some punchlines, so they're, you know funny what you just can't have somebody shitting or pissing and that's the punchline i I can't give away my what have i learned yet okay uh also brought to you by the cooperage uh barrels that'll cost you an arm and a leg yeah that was disturbing (laughs) (laughs) all right twas brillig and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabi all nimsy were the burgroves, and the moam wraths outgrabe. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jubjub bird, and shun the frumious bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand. Long time in maxome foe he sought. So rested he by the tum-tum tree, and stood a while in thought. And as in oofish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flames came whiffling through the tugly wood and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through, the vorpal blade went snicker-snack. He left it dead, and with its head he went galloping back. And hast thou slain the jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. O frabjous day, kalu kale, he chortled his joy. "'Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did dire and gibble in the wabe. "'All nimsy were the broar groves, and the moam wraths outgrub." Hilarion Seuss. And Hilarion Seuss. That made more sense than the actual fucking movie. <laughs> well, right, because we, um, we have Gilliam trying to strike out on his own, mm-hmm. yet he does subject matter really close to the holy grail yeah with palin and uh you know his own himself of course making an appearance and i think and jones terry was jones in there somewhere. yeah jones was terry in there somewhere. jones is in the very beginning okay and uh well so he still has half of python there yeah <laughs> and the 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 priest i'll call him the leader of that religious cult looked a lot yeah. like graham chapman Right. 
Well, you could just see who, you know, Cleese Chapman and yeah. Idol would play right. throughout this. So I don't know if he intended to do a Monty Python movie and they passed. Mm. Or did he just, I mean, really think that he could do a movie with half of Python and uh, get away with it? Yeah, but it's, uh, it, it, you know, our, our, our title this week sums it up. It's growl shaped. <laughs> Because, I mean, you know, it's just one age above where <laughs> the, uh, you know, the grail t- you know, leaves yeah. off. A little bit of trivia about that, because it all it also had Neil Ennis in a couple of roles. Yes. And for its American premiere, it was advertised as Monty Python's Jabberwocky, despite protests by Gilliam. Because, <laughs> right, and that doesn't help it at all, because no, no. people coming in to see it expecting python it's, it's like standard. we did as kids right <laughs> hilarity ensues that's the actual summary um because <laughs> <laughs> you know i don't think you need it. yeah okay cooper from a small town i'll take it cooper from a small town goes to the big city <laughs> um tries to get a job can't ends up accidentally squiring for a night and kills the Jabberwocky accidentally while running from the Dark Knight's henchmen. That's the movie. I mean, the funny point of that is, of course, is that they hired the Black Knight mm-hmm. to protect the Jabberwocky. Yeah. And uh, he winds up fighting it himself. Yeah. Incidentally, Proust played pretty much all the knights. He played the Red Herring Knight and all the Black Knights. Okay, now that makes sense. If you saw someone on a horse in a suit of armor, it was Prowse. And I didn't know he was that good a horseman. And that was the typical Prowse role. You know, when we were going to do a Prowse, when I suggested a Prowse tribute, it's like, okay, we did um, well, the Star Trek trilogy, we or Star Wars trilogy, sorry. And Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Shame. Goes to show Shame. where my brain has gone these days. Um, where my fandom has gone these days. Um <laughs> And we've done clockwork. So it's like, what else do you do? He actually had a considerable role in this. Even though he only had a couple of lines. And was his voice overdubbed, do you think? Because I, I think it probably was. From what I've heard of like behind the scenes stuff from Star Wars, it actually kind of sounds the same. So I think that well, was actually Prowse's voice. I think we heard his voice in clockwork. Not, and I've heard his voice in other things. He did, you know, when he passed away, someone posted this, like, traffic safe, like yes. safety ad that he had done years ago, the green something or other. Um, I've, so I've heard his voice, and I think that was actually him in his couple of lines to, to pale in on the horse. Um, now, at the very beginning, we see the first victim of the, the Jabberwocky, or the Jabberwock. Yes. Um, very evil dead shot. Because it closes yeah. right in on the face of the, the victim. It, it wasn't until that moment I realized that this was actually directed by Gilliam. Mm. <laughs> because I was like, that that's a shot that, like, I don't think I've ever seen in film before that, mm. you know? Yeah. That up close to the face where the camera's mounted to the face right. like that and they're moving around. And Sam Raimi totally stole it. Yes, completely. Now, I did like a couple of the names, I have to admit. Mr. Fishfinger, that was funny. <laughs> and King Bruno the Questionable. <laughs> I enjoyed that name. But a lot of it is just a lot of cheap, gross, Dark Ages jokes. Right. You know, it took... I'm trying to think of the first joke that I thought landed. Um, ah, let's Mr. see. Mr. Fishfinger. I remember we liked as as kids we liked the the messenger assassin bit, mm-hmm. but it didn't seem as funny this time around. Maybe because right. I was looking for it and it was expected. Mm-hmm. You know, it was you know a, a poor farmer stumbling in with you know holding a scroll but looking like a a big dagger, right. and the guards of course you know tackling him, mm-hmm. but which is was kind of a weird running joke through the movie of yeah. just like the guards. It's overzealous guards. Yeah, thinking he's going to be assassinated. Um, Oh, oh, yeah. And this is really laid into it. The hide and seek bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was was good. Um, You know, jumping ahead again, laid in. Uh, Yeah. The the whole Rube Goldberg machine that the armorer's shop turned into, that was a great set piece. Yeah. Um, 
got a kick out of the, the Herald, the long-winded Herald, who just kept going with his... He was basically the hype man for the yeah. king, and he just kept going and going. Got a kick out of that. Um, and and the religious zealots fighting over who's going to get set on fire and launched by a catapult. <laughs> catapult. There, there's, there's this doomsday cult that shows up partway through the movie. But the big problem for me, aside from the, the lack of actual comedy... Just couldn't get behind Dennis. He was just too clueless. Well, yeah, I think that was the point that he was just a bumbling idiot. Mm-hmm. That that still was still holding out for this peasant girl that you know yeah. couldn't make it more obvious that she hated him. Right. But he had this vision in his head, and he just wasn't going to let it go. Mm-hmm. I don't know why. But yeah, that was the point. He was just really clinging to this one idea. And it is kind of funny that he gets beyond his wildest dreams stuff, yeah. you know, in this at the end, you know? Like he ends the, up killing the Jabberwocky and marrying the princess. Marrying the princess and getting half the kingdom and everything. But it's just like he, you know, it's not what he, no. he didn't really want that. <laughs> And, so he gets the happily ever ending ahead. Right, ending, but he doesn't want But it, isn't yeah. happy with it. Right. Which, on paper, when you put it that way, is funny, but it just doesn't work in the movie. And I think the problem with the movie had was a lot of the satire is just too on the nose. Yeah. You know, it's just, uh, you know, they, the talk of, you know, and, you know, they, they kind of had some fun with that in the Holy Grail where they're talking about, I, I mean, where they go off on, like, mm. political systems right. and stuff and by peasants. But here to talk about, um, it isn't that absurd for the craftsmen to go off on the soulless businessman. And that's mm-hmm. exactly what the thing is here. You know, Palin is the soulless businessman or wants to be mm. the soulless businessman. Right. And his father wanted to be, you know, wanted you know, actually respected his craft. Mm-hmm. And then he goes into the city to find the, the, the really gifted Cooper is, uh, you know, just a beggar cause he's yeah. not in the union. Right. Yeah, but it, this is pretty much all spelled out a little yeah. too on the nose. Right. Right. Whereas I think even though they wrote in groups, I think in Python, a lot of it was filtered through the group as a whole. Yeah, and that I think they just had better people that knew what was funny and what yeah. wasn't. Well, that's the know? thing is these jokes would have been filtered through the other three, and or two, three. Yeah, yeah, idle. I'm forgetting about. You're yeah, missing um, idle in this yeah. too. Yeah, um, it would have been filtered through the other three and workshopped a bit, and they would have they would have worked. Um, yeah, I I did like um, also um, Gilliam's cameo as the diamond miner. And you know, yes. everybody's out to get his lucky diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> he pretty much was the lucky charms guy. Yeah. Well, well insisting that these stones were diamonds, and I was like, what yeah. are you talking about? And the West Tower falling apart. He's the king is talking to his daughter, who is in the East Tower. She's sequestered in this tower till the prince comes. And and you see a shot out the window where the the other tower is just crumbling. Nice effect shot. That was a little hint at where, where Gilliam was going to go. Yes. You know. I was surprised that the Jabberwocky himself wasn't embarrassing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was kind of, ex- you know, it's a 1977 movie. Yeah. I'm kind of expecting, like, you know, hardly, that we hardly see him at all. Well, we don't see him till the very end. Yeah. And which then. Is, of course, the good rule of thumb for yeah, any good right. creature movie. And he looked good. He, I mean, very. He, I think he must have inspired Labyrinth. I think from what I saw, Gilliam got some of the people that did the Godzilla movies. Oh wow! To to do this to mm-hmm. help him out with this, so that's why it was. I mean, he he put everything he could into it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it looked, reminded me a lot of the stuff from Labyrinth. You know, m- m- most of a decade later. Um, and that's Henson. It, 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 he could have influenced Henson. <laughs> I mean, the Muppet Show was already a thing, but I don't think the Dark Crystal was yet. No, 
No, so, they, that was early '80s as well. Yeah, this could have you know been a step toward the Dark Crystal, which you know was when Henson got interesting, um, or got really inter- intricate with his designs. Um, another thing I enjoyed was seeing. I, I don't think it was the, the the red herring, but I think he had a dog on his head one of the nights. And <laughs> he was the red herring. I that don't know was what the, the hell red that herring. Was. Okay. But he just, the Black Knight just nails him, knocks him out of the, practically out of the arena. He hits a wall, he hits the ground, bounces, hits a couple other things. That was a great stunt. <laughs> so how how did they do it with Prouse fighting Prouse? Or did they not have them in the same shot together? I don't I think, think they were it. ever in the same shot. You just saw somebody reaching over like the yeah. sword. Yeah, okay. so you saw the lance or the, or the flail. I think the only time you saw them hit must have had a stand-in was when um, the Black Knight took the flail to the, the Red Herring. I think that's the only time there must have been a stand-in there. Um, but the other thing, like, the thing that really sealed the movie was the with the, with the ending. When he, he kills the monster, but he's still, like, desperate for Griselda. <laughs> and the family is basically actually before he kills the monster because they're all over him after he kills the monster yeah because they're star fuckers but right you know before he kills the monster they're basically telling the entire family is telling him to go fuck himself right whereas before at least the parents were nice to him like he lost his donkey because of them and had to yeah. go on foot and he's still begging them to like him and i just couldn't get behind him at that point of course, but I think I think there's so many people like that, though. <laughs> but he's the protagonist. You're supposed to be right. on his side, and I just couldn't. You know, I think I think there's just so many people that are in oh, yeah. the toxic, of course, you know, abusive relationship, yeah. and they they fight to keep it. And you know, mm-hmm. he him just being whisked away in the the pal in the carriage, yeah. and just looking for. Griselda, well, you know, he's got the princess. And again, you put it that way, and and it works. Why doesn't it work in the movie? <laughs> Talking about it, the joke works. I just don't like it in the movie, and I don't know why. I I think, I don't even even frame it as a joke. I think he just, I mean, that was just... And I think that's uh, the problem with the movie. It's funny how this movie and last week's... Mm. I think both suffer from the same problem of just what's he want to make here? Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. does he want to make uh, a com a Monty Python style comedy? Mm-hmm. Does he want to make you know the statement of you know socioeconomic, uh, you know, right. circles? Because I think you could honestly say it's almost like an idiocracy of the Dark Ages. In a sense, yeah. Where I mean that that is the 1970s, mm-hmm. it, it, yeah, right there that. Right. That things are, I mean, I don't know if you blame the unions, of course, but, you know, it's kind of what he's doing with the guilds. Right. You know Gilliam's uh, filmography better than I do. What was his next movie? Uh, I think they did Life of Brian next, didn't they? Oh, okay. So it was still with the, yeah, Pythons didn't split till 80, I think. Um, but like on his, so he did the Python movies and then I think, was it Brazil was his first solo? Yeah, I think brazil let's see um the holy grail they have 75 oh time bandits okay was his next one after this okay and that was 81 so they don't have him down as directing of life of brian which is uh-huh. odd so he was okay and, and i didn't love uh time bandits but at least i mean either kind of fine starting to find his style there yeah you know um so this one, I think the problem here, I think he's, he was just kind of between doing the Python thing and finding his own voice. Right. He was trying to use the voice of Python, it felt. Mm-hmm. And, and he can't do that without Cleese no. and Chapman. Right. And I mean, Idol. you get away without Idol, I think. But without Cleese and Chapman, you're really up shit's creek. <laughs> I mean, that last season of Python without Cleese is like, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> there's some episodes where you're just kind of like, oh, I don't know. By the way, on the DVD commentary, uh, Gilliam states that the Jabberwock's death fall came about accidentally. The actor actually tripped during the filming, but it looked so natural that it was left in. 
<laughs> it did. It did look natural. And then it, we just had the insert shot of the sword going through its eye and, you know, killing it. No sequels and remakes. Obviously, no one should touch this. It's better as a poem. I mean, hmm. if you remade it, well, I guess there's a better way of making that poem into a movie, you know? Yeah, that, that's fair. That's fair. Um, But... If if not Gilliam, who? Oof. Jederowski, yeah. maybe? <laughs> um, Burton? Perhaps. I'm a little tired of Burton, but okay. Um, <laughs> I actually, now that he has a voice, I, I wouldn't mind seeing Gilliam take another shot at it. Oh, that's interesting. Coming back yeah. for, you know, 35 years later. Mm-hmm. Take another shot, see what you can do. Um, 45. Actually, 43. Yeah, 43 years later. Um, if he did it now. On the brains? On the brains. I'm going right down the middle. There are some things I liked, most some things I didn't like. Most of it just bored me. Two and a half. It's, uh, oof. I've been bouncing between two and a half and three mm-hmm. for quite some time here. Um, I'll say since I enjoyed it more than Ninja Cheerleaders, I'm uh-huh. going to go three. <laughs> okay. And what have yeah. we He actually had some jokes that landed as yeah. opposed oh, to yeah, Ninja yeah. Cheerleaders, which did uh-huh. not. <laughs> I mean, if I recall correctly, I gave that a one, so this is yes, quite a bump true. up for me. That is very true. Um, what have we Tyler, learned? just because you've got a potato doesn't mean you get to come in. Mm-hmm. And I learned that bathroom humor doesn't actually require bathrooms. <laughs> That's it for Jabberwocky. Until next time when we'll be reviewing Santa Jaws. I've seen the trailer. I've read a review. It actually looks pretty entertaining. Ah, uh, we just need something. As long as they know that they're making what they're making. Yeah, I think they do. Um, Thank God, because how many like weeks in a row have we seen movies mm-hmm. where they do not know what they're making? Yeah. And <laughs> we'll, four in a row. And we'll also be unveiling our top ten and bottom five lists for the year. Until then, of course, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are.